Welcome back to the world of Mark's Money Mind, coming to you from the Rocky Mountain town of Crested Butte, Colorado. I'm your host, Mark Troutman, CFP. This educational personal finance show combines money lessons, timely topics, personal stories, and community wisdom to help listeners and viewers master their finances to enjoy a stress-free life of financial freedom. Welcome to episode two of the Mark's Money Mind show. I wanted to thank everyone for all the wonderful reviews of the show that have been left on various podcast players, on the YouTube channel, and so forth. I'm truly honored, and thank you so much for your early support. And my goal is going to be to make this show as best as possible for all of you. I would also like to say, stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get some Mark's Money Mind swag by reviewing the show and sending in a picture of, or a snapshot of your review. And the first 20 people that do that, and we've had a number of people already do that. The t- top 20 is starting to dwindle. But anyway, thank you for all of you for doing that. And I do truly really appreciate it. And the support has been overwhelming. I wanted to start off this show. We're going to talk about what I call our mantra, which is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing when it comes to striving for financial freedom, financial independence, financial security, however you want to phrase that. And if you don't learn anything else, this, I think, is literally the pinnacle of achieving financial freedom. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But anyway, I recently got this book. So this book is Poor Charlie's Almanac. I don't know if you can see that here. Hopefully you can see that. And it's a revised edition. And Poor Charlie refers to Charlie Munger. And Charlie Munger was the co-chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's right-hand person. And if you want to understand a little bit more about who Charlie Munger is, Warren Buffett writes an annual letter for the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders, and it's available on BerkshireHathaway.com. And he does a wonderful tribute to Charlie because Charlie passed away this past November, 33 days before his 100th birthday. And when I received this book, of course, I opened it. I have read the previous editions before, so I've not read this current edition, but I open it up and right at the beginning is a quote. And it says, for Charles T. Munger, who in his own words would tell you, and then the quote begins, acquire worldly wisdom and adjust your behavior accordingly. If your new behavior gives you a little temporary unpopularity with your peer group, then to hell with them. Sorry for the four-letter word. Hopefully that's acceptable to everybody. But Charlie was definitely one who told it like it was. And I just thought this was very interesting, a very interesting quote to start this show off with, because what we're going to talk about may require you to actually walk a little differently than some other people. Because the way most people in the United States in particular run their financial lives is they basically earn money and spend it all, and in some cases spend more than all and get into debt and so forth. And the mantra that my wife and I came up with, which is a derivation of a quote we heard from a ski bum couple. Go back to the first episode and you can hear a little bit more about where this came from. But we basically came up with this mantra, I guess you would call it, or motto, make some, save and invest, live on the rest. Say it with me. Make some, save and invest, live on the rest. Literally, in my opinion, This is the key to financial success. If you live within your means, save and invest the difference. And I like to prioritize the saving and investing first. And we'll talk about paying yourself first. 
you will achieve the financial goals that you set out to achieve. It is that simple. And walking this path that differs from the standard one takes some fortitude. It's very beneficial if you have a supporting community. And that's the one thing I have found with the financial independence community. I talked a little bit about that in the first introductory episode. Surrounding yourself with people who are walking a similar path and are willing to maybe deviate from the norm. Ignoring the noise and the temptation is not easy, especially when I talk with my daughter and her friends and they tell me and show me all of the social media that they are digesting literally on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis in some cases. It's very hard to walk a different path. And so some people I know have literally just removed themselves from Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and so forth just to avoid all of that. And the reality is in those different platforms, what you're seeing in many cases is contrived. And in those cases where it is truly legitimate information or you know views into someone's life, they're only showing you a very small piece of reality, and in many cases, is not even reality to begin with. You're not seeing the, the less desirable parts of their lives, let's say. So anyway, what I wanted to do in this episode is talk a little bit about those three components. Make some, save and invest, live on the rest. And let's start off with make some. So I don't have a lot of advice on how you can make some. And the reason we use the word some, first of all, the reason we used it was because in the original quote that we read was make a little or make little. And we didn't like the word little. We liked to strive for a little bit higher than just a very minimal amount of income. So we decided to change it to some. But the reason we use the word some instead of a lot is that I think there's a point where there is an amount of money that you can make that is comfortable to you. And it's going to be different for every person. So I like the idea of some so that you can decide how much is your sum. And my route was the traditional standard route. I graduated high school in 1983. I know that sounds like an eternity to many of you, but that is when I graduated high school. And the standard route was you go to college, you get a job, you work until 65, and you're done. You get to retirement, you get to this fictitious retirement period where, you know, the pictures of the ads or living on a beach and drinking a pina colada or something like that. So I took the standard route. I went to college. I got a W-2 job, nine to five, commuted in and out of New York City initially. Fortunately, I was able to start working from home later, which is obviously very much more common today, but it was very uncommon back then. However, there are other ways to make money. Well, I talked to the high school students and all of them are in the class. It is a class that is geared towards going to college because that's literally what the class is. It's a senior seminar where they are preparing their applications for college, submitting their scholarship applications and so forth. And I just come in and teach financial literacy as a very small part of that program. And one of the things I really like to talk about is when you decide or if you decide to go to college, it is truly today a very large financial decision, potentially your largest in your lifetime, maybe second only to buying a home. I talked to the students about the idea that you really need to think about what is this going to cost and what are you going to get out of it? When I went to school or college, I did go to a private school. It was not inexpensive, but today colleges are so expensive. I'll give you a little story. So when I started my first job, there were five of us that came in at literally pretty much the same time within a year or two of each other. 
And we all came from different schools that were private, Ivy League, to low-cost state schools. And you know what? We all had the same exact start. And so I'm a huge proponent that you can get a great education at a variety of schools that vary significantly in cost. So I'm a big proponent of state schools, or even if you have the opportunity, maybe you can get some AP credits in high school and jump a grade or go to community college for a couple of years, or maybe even take some time off and decide what you really want to do. Because what I also find is that a lot of students come right out of high school, go directly to college and have no clue what they want to do. And that makes sense. They're only 17, 18, maybe possibly 19. But for them to have the idea of what they're going to do for the rest of their life, I think is a big ask. So potentially even taking some time off to give it some thought. And I'm also a fan of, you don't necessarily need to go to college. There are plenty of apprenticeship programs that you could do. One of the books that I think is very beneficial in talking about this is there's a book called, and I actually have a copy here, so I'm going to show it to you on the screen. And again, you can see all this on YouTube if you decide to come over there. And it's called Choose FI, Your Blueprint to Financial Independence. It was written by Chris Mamula, Brad Barrett, and Jonathan Mendoza. And Brad and Jonathan started the Choose FI podcast, excellent podcast, by the way. And Chris Mamula writes over at Can I Retire Yet? And I would like to say I could call him a friend. We've crossed paths many times. And it, this is an excellent book. So if you would like, I will put this in the show notes. And it's a great book. But anyway, in chapter eight, they have this really cool thing. It's kind of like a college decision tree flowchart. And it helps you decide, is college for you? So definitely check that out. Of course, all these books are available, I would presume, in your library. If not, you can go to your library and request a copy. I'm sure they could get it for you big fan of using libraries. They also in that chapter talk about what if you take a non-traditional path, a non-college path, for example. So there's a lot of discussion on that. And the more I see how much college costs, the more I'm a fan of making sure it's right for you. It used to be when prices were lower for college, it was kind of like, I don't want to say a no-brainer decision, but it was an easy decision, easier decision. You could decide, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get the experience, because there is something to be said about having that time to grow, time to mature. But the question is, how much is that going to cost you? So anyway, going back to the students, one of the things I do talk to them about, and I know the parents are very thankful for me talking about this, is that they, or you as a student, need to be involved in this decision from a financial perspective, as well as Ooh, this college is cool. I went on this little trip to see it and boy, they have a great campus and wow, look at their dorms and look at all of the gym stuff. Cause that's what they show you. They're trying to get you to come to this school. When you sit down yourself or with your parent or parents to make this decision, think about it very seriously about this is a major financial decision you're making. You want to make sure that you get your money's worth and the experience that you're looking for. I, I just think that it's so important to make sure that you're making the right decision. I'll, I'll give you another little story and hopefully my daughter doesn't mind me talking about this, um, but we saved for her college using a 529 plan. And I'm sure we'll talk about 529s in the future for sure, but we used it to save for her college education. And we also used a custodial brokerage account before we knew much about 529s. And when it came time for her to decide what school to go to and how much, you know, we were definitely looking at the numbers, we told her that she had this amount of money in these accounts. And if it cost more, she would have to figure it out, take loans, what have you. And if it cost less, she would get to keep the money. And it's funny because I should have talked to Doug Nordman, who wrote a book with his daughter. And I just, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember it, but I'll stick it in the show notes it talks about raising money savvy children. I know that's part of the title or the subtitle. But anyway, his deal with his daughter was she got to keep half. I wish I had read his book before <laughs> before uh, I made that uh, choice or my wife and I made the choice to give it all to her, but that's fine. And she actually decided to go to a state school 
she went to Colorado State University, go Rams in Fort Collins. And um, that school costs, it still costs a lot of money. And when you think about tuition, room and board and so forth, it was about $25,000 a year. And she went for a four-year undergrad and a one-year graduate program. And she did get a little bit of merit scholarship and sponsorship and so forth. But state schools don't give out a lot of scholarship. It was mostly a full cost and we did not have the ability to get any financial aid. So she ended up using not all of her money. And that was her start in life was that leftover money. So I think bringing her into that decision was so important because A, she knew how much it was costing to go to school because effectively it was like she was spending her own money. And secondly, she got an awesome education, loved the school, was there for the full time Graduated undergraduate school on time in four years, got a one-year master's program, and she's off to the races. So huge proponent of you do not have to overpay for college. And one of the things I do want to add in here about college costs is, I hate rule of thumbs, but I'm going to use this one anyway. So one of the things in the kind of the financial planning world people talk about is how much student debt is too much and how much is manageable and kind of a rule of thumb. And again, you can take this with a grain of salt, but the rule of thumb is don't come out of school with more student debt than what you expect to earn in the first year of your job out of college. And that's kind of a manageable figure to be able to pay back on the normal payment schedule, which is typically over 10 years and also, you know, if you're getting federal student loans, those rates are fixed. Those rates tend to be very low. In fact, my daughter's now she got very lucky in that when she went to school, she did get very small student loans because she was unsure about what graduate school might cost and so forth. And the rates on her loans are actually 2.5% and 3.25%. So she's actually made the decision not to pay them back quickly because the money sitting in her brokerage account is actually earning more and she's making the spread. But she could pay him off if need be with the excess funds that were left over, but has basically decided to earn the difference <laughs> on the difference between what she earns in the money market account versus what she's paying in student loans. But that's a, another story. But keep those student debts low. That's very, very important because too many people come out of school with very large student debts and it becomes this albatross, this chain around you. That's very difficult to get out of, especially if you're borrowing a lot of money. And usually that's the case when you're going to grad school or medical school or what have you. And that's where the loans get really big. And then I also want to give a shout out to Jordan Grumman, who wrote the book Taking Stock. And I've asked my daughters, and of course, I give her all these books and, you know, I do ask her which ones are her favorite. And this is one of her favorites. And I think it's because in that book, in part two, there's a parable of the three brothers. And basically it talks about three kind of hypothetical brothers. The oldest brother takes the fast track. He's going to make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time to get to financial independence as quickly as possible. And then there's the middle brother who takes a slightly slower route and takes a little bit more of his time to get to the finish line, does some side trips on the way, but eventually gets there. And then there's the third brother who basically it's called the passion play loves what he does has no intention of retiring, quote, retiring, has no desire to get to the financial finish line. And in fact, when he does get to the end of the journey, he turns around and walks back on the same path because he likes it so much. I think of artists in this respect. Many of the people I've met who are artists truly, truly love what they do. They're not doing it for the money and would continue to do it until the day they die. So anyway, I just think it's a really neat story and it talks about how you can think about, do I want to take the fast track? Do I want to take the middle road or do I want to take the slow path? And what's interesting is I think about when I was reading that the first time I was thinking about who am I, who do I identify with? 
And what's interesting is you don't have to be the same brother all the time. So I would say definitely at the outset, I was the older brother. Make as much money as you can, work in New York City, even though I didn't like it, didn't like working in New York City, long commute. But eventually I downshifted, I guess you would say, to the middle brother. And because I started pushing back and saying, I don't need to make the absolute top dollar. I'd rather make decisions that are beneficial for me and my family. So I would say I shifted from being the older brother to the middle brother. And maybe today you could call me the younger brother because what I'm doing now here is for fun. A, I'm not doing it for money. And B, I just enjoy doing this and talking to people about this stuff. Anyway, so that was a long story on make some. So let's jump over to save and invest. And this is where I like to think of this as pay yourself first automate your savings. And another great book is I Will Teach You To Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. I'm not a huge fan of the title. I think it's very sensational, but he has an awesome podcast and an awesome book. And actually the books that I give out to my high school students, this is one that I certainly always give out because it talks about automating your savings, getting your kind of financial house in order and so forth. And I am a big, big fan of automating your deductions from your paycheck or your checking account to make sure that saving and investing is prioritized and then you can live on the rest. So let's talk a little bit about how to do that because it's interesting. I was talking to my daughter the other day and she said, you know, one of the questions I get from a lot of my friends is how should I prioritize my savings? What about student loans? How do I do this? And so I like to think of it this way. If you have credit card debt, that is like your hair is on fire because the interest rates on credit card debt are so, so high that literally that's something you must prioritize ASAP because that is just going to move you backwards quickly if you don't get that under control and out of your life. But I also believe that it's important to not just do that. So how do you do that? Well, if you work at a company and you have a 401k plan, frequently there's going to be a match, which basically means that you contribute a certain amount to your 401k plan. Many plans are are designed like this. So this is just a hypothetical example. You would contribute, say, 6% of your salary, and they will match 50 cents on the dollar for the first 6%. And then if you put in 7%, they're only going to match that first six. So basically you put in six and they match 50 cents on the dollar. So they basically put in another three. So you're getting 9% into your 401k plan by you only putting in six. That's like a 50% return on your initial dollar. And so I think that's something you definitely don't want to forgive, even if you have credit card debt to pay off. So I would at least sign up for your 401k plan for the amount that requires you to get the full match. Now, for the younger people in this audience, a lot of questions will be, do I put it in the Roth 401k? Do I put it in the traditional, which is pre-tax? For younger people who have a very long runway and typically are in a relatively low tax bracket, at least relative to what their tax brackets will be over their lifetime, I'm a big fan of the Roth. Now, of course, there are going to be situations where that doesn't make as much sense, but the Roth, basically what that means is that you do not get a tax deduction on the money you contribute to the Roth portion of the 401k plan. And this could be the same for a 403b plan if you work for a public entity, for example. However, the money in that account grows tax-free as it would in the traditional bucket. But when you go to withdraw it down the road, there is no tax on it. So you don't get the tax advantage on the way in, but you get the tax advantage on the way out. And the traditional works different. You get the tax deduction on the way in while the money is in the account, it grows tax-free. But when you take it out, it is all taxed at your 
normal income tax rate. It does not have preferential treatment like dividends and capital gains do in a brokerage account. And I won't go into that, but we will certainly talk about that in the future. But if you're very young, just starting out in a low tax bracket, I'm a huge fan of the Roth. And also the match that you get from your company is typically going to go into the traditional bucket. So effectively, you're tax diversified by yours going into the Roth and your employer's match going into the traditional. So that's one thing to think about. I also think it's important to set up a savings plan for things like emergency savings. So the idea of an emergency savings account is to basically cover expenses that are unexpected. Now, it's kind of like the expected unexpected, right? So you know things are going to come up. You just don't know when they're going to come up or how much they're going to be. And the big one is if you were to lose your job, for example, that's really where an emergency savings account really has a lot of value. Now, if you have credit card debt, somebody would say, wait a minute, I have credit card debt and I'm paying, let's say, 20% interest on that credit card. Why would I put money in a savings account earning a minimal amount? Most savings accounts at brick and mortar banks are not going to pay literally any interest. And if they do, it's pennies. So I'm a big fan of opening an online savings account. It still has FDIC insurance, which basically means that as long as your account is below $250,000, there's no risk that even if the bank went under, you would lose any money. And I'm a big fan, and this is not a you know paid endorsement by any means. This is just a bank I use and my daughter uses it and many of her friends use it. It's Ally. And the reason is because it's an online bank. It has good interest rates, and it also allows you to bucket, which basically means that with one savings account, you can create savings buckets. And that's what I do. So I have an emergency savings bucket. I have one for vacations. I have one for other specific savings goals. So it's a really nice choice for being able to segment your savings account. But anyway, I do think it's important to at least get your muscles working by having an emergency savings account opened, even if you're only going to deposit, let's say, $25 a month or something very small, just to get in the habit of the automatic payments are going from my checking account or potentially your paycheck, which some companies will allow you to redirect your paycheck to multiple locations. So you could say the majority goes into my checking account and then this X small percent goes into my savings account, for example, or you can just have the whole paycheck directed to your checking account. And then the day after you get paid, which is for many people, either the end of every other week or the 15th and the last day of the month. And you could set up an automatic transfer the day after, or maybe two days after just to be super safe for that whatever amount that you've decided to go directly into that savings account. So even though you still need to, let's say, pay off credit card, having that emergency savings account opened and starting to be funded is very beneficial. Then the next kind of order of operations, I guess you would say, would be your Roth IRA. Now, there are income Limits to that, most people are going to be able to contribute to a Roth IRA within the income limit. And we talked about the Roth 401k, the Roth IRA is very similar, except it means individual retirement arrangement. Many people think it's individual retirement account, but it's actually arrangement. In any event, it's an account that you open your on your own as opposed to through your employer. And you could open it at places like, I like low-cost brokerage firms like Charles Schwab, Fidelity, or Vanguard, and then investing the contributions into the Roth IRA, into low-cost index funds. I won't get into that today, but we'll talk about that in the future for sure. And most of these do not have minimums. I know Charles Schwab and Fidelity do not. Vanguard may, but I'm, I don't think they do for a regular Roth IRA brokerage account. What I would suggest doing is opening that account and funding it in the same way you're doing the emergency savings account with a very small token amount to get the habit started. 
Now, you can invest up to $7,000, and again, this is individual, so it's per person if you're married, per year into a Roth IRA. And that's in addition to what you can do in a 401k, for example, or a 403b. So this is on top of that. It works the same way. You don't get a tax deduction for the contributions. The money that is in there continues to earn tax-free. And then when you take it out, there is no tax. And the nice thing about the Roth IRA versus the traditional IRA, because there are traditional IRAs as well, which basically you get the tax deduction, is that the Roth IRA allows you to take out your contributions at any time without penalty because there was no tax advantage of it going in. And what's interesting about the Roth IRA, same with traditional IRAs, is that I like to think of it as a window that closes every year. So every year you can put in $7,000, but let's say you get to a year later and you're like, you know what? I wish I could have contributed for last year. You can do that up until April 15th for the prior year or whenever you file your tax return. But let's say it's past April 15th and you're like, oh man, let's say it's June of 2024. And you're like, oh, I wish I had put money in my Roth IRA last year in 2023. Well, that window is closed. You can do it for 2024, but you can't go back in time. So I look at it and say, utilize that window while it's open, knowing that you could get those contributions out at any time. However, I don't suggest you do that, but you can do that. So it's like a window that closes, but you can put money in and you could get it out if you really, really, really needed it. And then, of course, you can set up, like we were talking about at Ally, multiple savings buckets. Some people do things like vacation accounts because, again, it's better to save for your vacation first and then go on vacation than it would be to go on vacation, put it on a credit card, and try to figure out how you're going to pay it off when you get back. That's never fun. Or you could do what my friend Bill Yount over at uh, Catching Up to Fi likes to talk about sinking funds. So creating different savings accounts for things like maybe your insurance is paid once a year. So you put money in the savings account throughout the year. And then when the bill comes, you've got the money to pay it. Or maybe it's for a new car down the road, or maybe it's for car maintenance that is standard, you know, that you know you're going to have car maintenance. Um, or maybe it's for gifts at the end of the year. Maybe you gift to friends and relatives at the end of the year and you want to save up for that throughout the year. So you can create all these little buckets in your savings account to do that. And you could have an automatic contribution go to that account and divide it among those buckets as you choose. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, and some people ask me, well, how much do I pay myself first? Well, we talked a little bit about the rule of 20% and where that came from, if you recall from the first episode, was I was reading the book, The Wealthy Barber and The Millionaire Next Door. The Wealthy Barber talks about saving 10% of everything you make. The Millionaire Next Door talked about the millionaires typically are saving 20% or more of all of their income. So my wife and I decided 20% sounds like a good number and that's what we chose you can decide whatever you want to pay yourself first. But one of the things I would caution you on is be careful about putting it too, too high for two reasons. One is you're likely to want to change that because you're going to find it too restrictive. And you also don't want to have a life of deprivation on your savings route. And we'll talk about this on the live on the rest section. but. For us, creating a minimum number of 20% seemed very doable, and that's what we did. However, we did save more than that frequently, but it usually was somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 30 or 35%. It wasn't much more than that, and I did talk a little bit about how I, we calculated that, and it's based on gross income. So basically, we would look at our gross income 20% of that was always saved. And that does include things like your 401k and things like that. Student loans, we didn't talk about that. So in many cases, student loans are going to have, especially federal student loans, are going to have interest rates that are relatively 
reasonable. Like I said, my daughter's was two and a half percent on one year. She took it out and 3.25 on the other. I think today it's 5%, if I recall, for current loans, which still is not that bad. Certainly nowhere near credit card interest rates, for example. So some people ask, should I just be paying off my student loans and do all this other stuff when I'm done with paying off my student loans? My opinion is I think you should do both. And here's why, because I think it's important to get into the habit of certainly filling that emergency fund. And we didn't talk about how much to put in the emergency fund. So let me just quickly say that the goal should be somewhere between three to six months of what I would consider your base living expenses. Think of expenses if you lost your job. What are the expenses I would continue to be needing to pay if I lost my job? And three to six times that would be a great target for your emergency savings account. But again, you're not going to get there right away. It's going to take some time. So I think it's important to be funding that emergency savings fund. I think it's important to be getting the full match in your 401k. If you had credit card debt, I would be paying the minimum payments to the student loans and then everything else I possibly could to my credit card debt to get that gone. That is absolutely a must. You need to get that gone because the rates on credit card debt is so high. There's certainly no investment that's going to consistently and reliably pay as much as a credit card interest rate. So that needs to be goal number one. Once those are paid off, Then you can go back to say, okay, now that I have excess money because it's not going to the credit card payments anymore, where should it go? Well, that's where you could consider upping your 401k contribution, upping your Roth IRA contribution, upping your savings contributions, or what have you. And so the same with student loans, I would say, and again, this is just how I would look at it. This is not advice by any means. This is just a way to think about this. I would say if my student loan rates were in the neighborhood of 5%, I would just pay it on schedule. And that's probably the interest rate on most people's student loans who have taken them out recently, or it could even be lower like my daughter's. If it starts to get into the 7% area, that's when I would start to really prioritize it. And certainly if it was higher than 7%, I would look to prioritize that as well. Let's summarize here. We got to make some, save and invest, pay ourselves first, 20%. You know, we talked about the order of operations there. And then literally what's left over is what we can live on. I think it's really important to live a life of balance and give yourself the ability to enjoy life while you're on this road to financial freedom, financial independence, because it's not going to be a short road. It takes some time to get there. And you do want to have fun on the way, right? Don't we all want to have fun? I do. So I think living a life of balance is really important. But then you say, how do I do that with what's left over? And here's where I like to come back to one of Remit Sadie's, the author of I Will Teach You To Be Rich and the podcast of the same name. He likes to say, spend lavishly on the things you value and be ruthless on the things you don't. So really think about what's important to you and have your live on the rest portion go towards those. And then things that are unimportant, try to eliminate them or at least significantly reduce them in your cost structure. And the other thing that's important is to avoid lifestyle creep. And my daughter, when I was talking to her the other day, was saying that some of her friends ask about how to avoid lifestyle creep. One, for sure, as I mentioned, is ignore social media influences. Those things in many cases are contrived. Those people are not living on islands in beautiful locations every day of their life. They may be on vacation and showing you that or pretending to, but that's probably not their everyday life. So the best thing to do is just try to turn that off. And yes, you can watch it, but just remind yourself that this is a glorified view of someone's life. And in fact, it might be a fictitious view of somebody's life. I also think, especially for those just starting out, 
it is so much easier to avoid lifestyle creep if you start off with this kind of plan where you're saving 20% of everything you earn and potentially even a little bit more. And you design your life around that initially. It's so much easier than when I talk to people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who are just starting to understand and learn some of this stuff. And they're like, I don't save anything. How am I going to do this? Well, you may need to cut some stuff out of your life. And for many people, that's difficult, especially if they own their home, they have a couple of cars, they're used to going out to dinner two or three times a week or whatever it is going on vacations at a certain level to tell them to cut back is very hard. It's a lot easier if you start out saving 20% or more at the outset, design your life around that. And then, for instance, let's say you get a raise, you say, all right, half is going to go to improving my lifestyle and the other half is going to increase my saving and investing. And maybe you're not able to start off, especially if you just... Let's say you're five or 10 years into your work and you're realizing, oh, I can't just immediately save 20%. Well, maybe the easiest way to do it is to say, when I get a raise, I'm going to give myself a little bit of a lifestyle boost, maybe a quarter of it or half of it. And the other half is going to go to increase my saving and investing rate. But it's easiest for the people that are just starting out because it's so much easier to design your life from the beginning this way, as opposed to try to go backwards once you learn this. And that's why I love talking to younger people because it's so much easier for them to start off on the right foot if they have this information to begin with. I also think it's so beneficial to surround yourself with friends and acquaintances that share these same values. It is so much easier to stay on track that way. So for example, you know, like I said, I'm in this FI community and we enjoy ourselves. We get together, we do things, but instead of saying, Hey, let's meet up at a restaurant and boy, look at these cocktails they are $15 each. And these appetizers are $20 each. And, you know, you're staying there and maybe, Oh, let's go out to see a band afterwards or whatever. What many of us will do is get together and it might be at someone's house in the backyard, bring your own. It might be potluck. It might be BYOB or whatever, BYO, your non-alcoholic beverage, whatever your food and beverage of choice is. Because what is really important is the camaraderie and the social aspect, not where you're doing it, right? And in many cases, it might be just, hey, let's go on a hike and then afterwards we'll you know, in my case, I do enjoy a frosty beverage every once in a while, grab something at a store on the way home and go hang out and sit around and just have fun. And actually, I find those conversations are so much better because you can have really deep conversations when you're in a comfortable environment than when you're in some restaurant and it's loud and then trying to turn the tables. So surround yourself with people who are willing to do that same thing Or if not, make it a suggestion. Say, hey, guys, instead of going out this weekend, how about we get together at whatever place, um, park? It could be anything. And just say, I'm going to bring this and maybe you could bring that and, you know, we'll have a great time. I think that's so important to surround yourself with people that are like-minded because it's a lot easier to do this. And then the other thing is, you know, you can certainly think about, The big three. So the big three are housing, transportation, food. And if you don't have insurance, like health insurance through your employer, insurance is going to be a big one, health insurance. I know it's big for me. It's a big part of my budget because I buy my insurance on the healthcare marketplace. Really paying attention to the cost of housing can be hugely beneficial because a lot of people get in over their head when it comes to housing. And it's a decision that is very hard to change. If you're a renter, you know, you could change it at the end of your lease. If you own your home, it's even harder to change. So I'm a huge fan of renting, by the way. I think homeownership does have a lot of costs that people don't take into account uh, that can be very expensive. And when it comes to transportation, I'm a huge fan. Well, I used to be a huge fan of buying used cars. I still am. Unfortunately, used cars and new cars have similar 
prices these days, but I am definitely a huge fan of driving a car as long as possible. In fact, my two cars right now, one has 210,000 miles as a 2008, and the other one, which is like a, a utility kind of junk vehicle that has really no value, is a 2004 with 165,000 miles. So if you can drive your car a really long time, get a decent car, drive it a long time, make sure it's fuel efficient or potentially even an electric vehicle today and keep the cost of fuel, whether that be gas or electric and maintenance as low as possible and drive it for a long, long time. Or if you live in a city, maybe don't even have a car. You can just take Ubers if you need to, or public transportation. And that's another thing when you, when it comes to housing, think about finding a place, especially if you're in a, an urban or a large city area, find a place where public transportation is going to be readily accessible because that'll save you a ton of money. And then food, groceries, I definitely still clip coupons. I, except I do it electronically before I go to the grocery store, I always use a list and I always go through the app to clip all of the coupons that are available. And it only takes me a few minutes and I definitely save at least, I would say, 10 to $15 every time I go to the grocery store. And then eating out, I really, like I said, I'd rather get together with friends locally and do potluck rather than going out. But when I do go out, I am very cautious about how frequently I go, where I go, because it's not usually about where you go and how much it costs. It's about the friends that you're doing it with. So I do want to mention that I had thought about adding some pieces to the end of each show. I've been taking some video shorts when I'm out and about, but I don't think they're going to work as well in the podcast format. So I think the best thing to do is I'm going to publish them as shorts on the YouTube channel. So you can check them out over there and it's just going to be money moments from here and there. Really short videos, a few minutes, but just thoughts I have while I'm out and about. And usually it's in a pretty cool location. Uh, so I thought that would be a fun little ad. Thanks for listening and I will see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's show. Please click follow on your favorite podcast player or subscribe on YouTube to ensure you don't miss any future shows. Also, please leave a rating and review for the show. The first 20 people who send a screenshot of your review, along with your mailing address to me at mark at marksmoneymind.com, will receive some Mark's Money Mind swag. If you would like me to answer a question on the show, please send it to me at mark at marksmoneymind.com and put podcast question in the subject line. Let me know your first name or let me know if you would like to remain anonymous and also your state of residence if you choose. I would also appreciate it if you would recommend this show to friends and family that might benefit from this content. See you next week on the Mark's Money Mind show. Until then, make some, save and invest, live on the rest. And now for the all-important disclaimer. This show is for education and entertainment purposes only and should not be considered investment, tax, or legal advice. Please consult the appropriate advisor or advisors before implementing anything you hear on this show or any other show for that matter. While I fully intend for everything on this show to be true and accurate at the time of each recording, occasionally errors may occur. So please do your own due diligence on anything discussed.